extraordinary that there's nothing that the coronavirus doesn't touch. We've all seen Black Lives Matter demonstrations. Oppression is brought out. So unfortunately, because I just feel like we're, we're going down this road, we've been down this road before. Hello and welcome to Your Voice. I'm Tech Kofi. Now, if black lives are going to matter, the education system will need to start playing its part. Exclusions of black students continue to run at higher levels than those of students from other ethnicities. Black children are three times as likely as white children to be permanently excluded, while representation of black teachers at the higher levels of the profession continues to be remarkably low, with, for example, only 0.7% out of a total of more than 21,000 university professors self-identifying as black. Moreover, when it comes to university attendance, while this has improved, the elite institutions are still apparently resistant to bringing black students into their fold. While 8% of the total university population is black, only 1.5 and 1.2% respectively are the figures for Oxford and Cambridge universities. Employment opportunities reflect all the trends above. Unemployment in the white population is at 4%, rising to 9% in the black communities. So tonight, looking forward to a society in which black lives really matter, your voice asks, are our kids being miseducated? Now, as always, your voice is welcome to add questions to put to our studio guests via the number shown on the screen below. First, joining me here in the studio to dissect this issue is public speaker and educator Danielle Roxon and founder and CEO of Black Impact, C.Y. Ochoga. A real pleasure to have you join us. Thank you. Thank Let's you. dive right in. Do you think, in your experience of the educational system, that the curriculum teaches black kids their cultural background and identity? See why? No. Simply put, <laughs> for a number of reasons. Um, you would not find... Okay, no. I was reading an article the other day about um, black and Asian... Um, a black and Asian association that's been campaigning, that began campaigning about this mm. 30 years ago, mm. trying to bring diversity into the curriculum. Mm. Even the National Union of Students, the NUS, has done a lot of campaigning work around mm -hmm. the whiteness of the curriculum, mm -hmm. and why in a campaign called "Why is our, Why is our curriculum white?" Mm -hmm. And so you find that there is a problem. If not, these campaigns will not be happening. Mm. White black British education, black British education is not taught in classrooms. They're not taught about the benefits that black people have brought into Britain. No one talks about Paul Stevenson and, and the Bristol bus boycott. That's not even a thing. The only time you hear about black British education is when maybe Notting Hill comes around. And in fact, that's only Caribbean. And in such a multicultural society, the multiculturality doesn't get into the classrooms. It's only in October when Black History Month comes around, mm. then people start to talk about black British history, but they only For 30 focus days? Yes, for 30 days. Okay. Now, Dan Danielle, t tell me, I mean, you're a recently qualified teacher, yeah. and, but you've been in the educational system all your life. What was your experience growing up, um, kind of going through school, GCSEs, A-levels, of what you were taught about your background? Yeah, I mean, um, within education, definitely was never taught about, you know, who I am as a black person or how black um, people have actually contributed to British history. Never taught that. How did um, that make you feel about yourself growing up? If I'm honest, I just wasn't aware. Um, I wasn't aware, and so therefore I didn't really have an opinion of it. Right. I just didn't know. Right. And so it wasn't until I'm much older that I le learn about you know, the contribution that we actually bring, and then I'm like, oh, okay, we're actually doing a lot, but I didn't, I didn't hear about this, so I didn't learn about this growing up. So speaking as an educator, do you think this makes a person who doesn't know who they are or how they fit in fit 
to give the best of themselves, for themselves and for their society? Absolutely not, because if you don't know, for example, that you are a princess by being the child of a king, you will always live as somebody else that you're a not. Pauper. So you exactly as a pauper. So there is an importance in understanding fully who we are as black people and our origins and our contributions to this country and, and in especially and where else, where better than in our educational systems. Educational systems are taught from an angle of colonialism and um, it's taught from the angle of where Britain has ruled and conquered the and you know all of those things but not what black people contributed no one talks about black inventors no one talks about you know it's only what you see on tv outside of the classroom where students are supposed to be molded and shaped so black people are seen as subjects more than actors within yes. wi wi within their lives now what is the result of that the result of that is unfortunately stereotypes yeah. subconscious biasness comes in um black children Do you mean within the black children or within the wider society um with the within the wider society but even within as an educator teachers and how they even relate with young people um and it's, it's so important that we have black role models for myself i teach citizenship mm -hmm. and right. so part of that i actually ensure that my examples reflect the demographic within my class right. and i see the impact that that has mm -hmm. on my young people how does it affect well, positively. Mm -hmm. I can give you an example of where it has negatively affected them. Um, one, one example, I actually spoke to my young people about stereotypes, subconscious biasness, police brutality. Mm -hmm. And what the effect of that was my young children left class feeling angry, especially my young black boys. They were fuming. Um, they felt really hopeless that they couldn't do anything. I then took on the next lesson and decided that, okay, I'm, I need to show them black role models. I need to show them young black people that have actually made a difference, that are making a difference in our, in their so in the, in our society. And I saw the change. I saw how a lot of them felt propelled to make a difference in their community. So if you don't have inspired teachers like this who are going the extra yeah, to, mm -hmm. to put context to the ed education of young children mm -hmm. so that they can see themselves as actors within society. Do you think that this may have something to do with the fact that there are so many exclusions of young black kids in, society, in, in the educational system today? Ooh, yes, yes. How, do uh, how does it cause it? Because w with an absence of black role models, with an absence of black people in the classrooms, head teachers are white, classroom teachers are white, there is no understanding of the cultural context and the and subjects you're studying, all the heroes. Yes, are white. everything <laughs> is white. So there's no understanding of the cultural context and yeah. the nuances that the black children exhibit in classrooms. And so it's often misinterpreted yeah. a lot of times that so if imagine in a situation where the classrooms become more diversified okay. you get a richer context you get a richer background right. you get a, gain a richer a, a different understanding of the students and so exclusions could come down so there needs to be a re-education of yeah. the educational system itself mm. to reflect the society and the so students that come into class so even when black kids stay in school let's take a look at some of the outputs mm -hmm. of their educational experience at GCSE, the highest attainment eight scores came from the Chinese mm. at, with 64.2. And amongst black people, the score dropped to 45.0. In fact, they were the lowest, lowest but one attaining ethnic group. Has this got something to do with the curriculum that's being taught them, Daniel? I think it's something to do with the curriculum, but then I also think it's something to do with the biasness that portrays within the system, the system and how teachers and educators but view those young people. But surely an exam is an exam is an exam is an exam, oh or yeah. is it not? Oh, 100%. An exam is an exam, but remember that the exam is the aftermath of what has been going on throughout the year, Absolutely. throughout how you relate with Absolutely. your young people. And if you're, put, if you're putting low target grades for your, you know, your young black children, for example, then that can even have a self-fulfilling prophecy on them. They lower their self-esteem. They now don't become all that they can come. No one's empowering them. No one's expecting much from them. Okay. And so therefore they become exactly that self-fulfilling prophecy that they've put upon them. Because, I mean, these, these trends actually become even starker when you look at the A-level results. Mm -hmm. 22.5% uh, of students from Chinese ethnic groups uh, got three A grades or better mm. at A level. Um, but only 5.1% of black students got three A grades or better. That's the lowest percentage of the six broad ethnic groups. Mm -hmm. Explain. If you look at 
data that exists, you see that there is a 26% attainment gap for black students. So that means that they are less likely to graduate with the first class or a 2 1 in comparison with their white counterparts. This is at university? This is at university. Mm. And I believe that it goes all the way. It stems all the way from when they were in secondary school, from, in fact, from primary school. It's, it's the expectation that's been placed on them right from the very beginning all the way up. And this affects the mindsets of black students as they progress through the educational system. Mm. They're, and then a lack of role models in the classroom is that the people that are there in front of you as tutors, as teachers, as all of these things, are not expecting a lot from you anyway. And if so we're going to get our kids into mm -hmm. the elite universities, it's really important that they start performing at the GCSE level. Mm -hmm. Is that not so? Well, yes. yeah, yeah, at GCSE, yeah. 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 Uh, because Oxford won't offer you a place yeah. unless you are predicted to get yeah. grades of a certain yeah. uh, degree. So mm -hmm. it doesn't really matter mm -hmm. how well you do at A level. Yeah. If you miss that cutoff window, you won't get the opportunity. Mm -hmm. How does it affect our people? If I'm honest with you, I think a lot of it needs to go also from home. You have to understand that, yeah, we're putting a lot of pressure on the education system. We expect this from teachers. But what about the parents? Mm. If I think about how where I am right now, I can't necessarily say it was due to my teachers. But I, no offence to my teachers who are maybe watching this, but I, ha I can say that actually it's probably due to my upbringing. It's due to my community. It's due to my parents. It's due Holds. to my... Danielle, let, let me ask you to hold that thought. Yeah. We'll come back in part B to continue the conversation. Now, we're going to take a short break, but please join us again for part two, where we'll be continuing the conversation. See you in a few moments. Welcome back to Your Voice with me, Ted Kofi, and my guests, Danielle Roxon and C.Y. Ochoga. Now, C.Y., I just want to pick up on the thought that uh, we, Danielle left us with. Right. It, it seems that she's putting some of her success through her educational career mm -hmm. with the supplemental efforts that were made mm -hmm. by her family, mm -hmm. uh, her extended family, other factors. How important is this? in the education of young black children. You see, there's an African proverb that says that until the lion lens learns to write, all the stories will glorify the hunter. And so until the African parents, until black parents start to say, start to teach their kids the realities of black history, the realities of who they really are down to their roots, their kids will only get what, the, what, what is said to them in class, which is not a lot. So hence, there's a lot of responsibility on parents, on families themselves, to tell the children, to tell, educate children. But those about parents the are paying taxes. Yes. Those taxes go to the government. Yes. It's supposed to fund a f an education that makes their children fit. Absolutely. What are organisations like Black Impact doing mm. to to fill that gap, to campaign for changes in the curriculum, really to hold the government's feet to, to the, the fire, fire to make sure that they're doing what they're supposed to do. In fact, we've recently had uh, organized, been in conversations with black students across the country who've been upset, obviously, in the recent development of things that have gone on with the brutal murder of George Floyd, with the misrep well, with the disproportion disproportionate um, representation of black people um, facing COVID. <coughs> and black students are upset at their universities, for example, for coming out with statements of solidarity, mm -hmm. when in fact those are just PR stunts, mm -hmm. when the realities on the ground in universities that you universities fail to recognize the very existence of black students in um, services that are not culturally competent. So Black Impact is working currently now, working behind the scenes to hold universities' feet to the fire in coming up with something that truly represents that solidarity that they're calling out. The Advance HE came up with something called the Race Equality Charter. What's which the Advance HE? Advance HE is one of the organizations um, that govern higher education in the country, right. came up with um, a race equality charter, right. and which is supposed to award universities gold, silver or bronze based on their fulfilling certain metrics on getting race on the agenda and making sure that universities are racially balanced. But 
The Guardian, in fact, recently called that a shambles. It has failed because universities are just satisfied with bronze and that's okay. There's nothing extra that they want to do. So we want to get around the table. We started having those conversations to get around the table to develop a charter that is actually fit for purpose. Okay, so I mean, this is very performative, yeah. uh, this kind of support. Um, what would you expect them to do? What do you, as an educator yourself, yeah. what does good look like in this arena? What would make the children fit for purpose educated? I think one examples, um, role models, examples within the system, within the curriculum, not limiting Black History Month to just a month, but actually having it w embedded within our within our curriculum. And that's not to make it as black as superior and now have an another problematic situation. We also want that diversity within other communities. Mm. Um, but having those role models, having more black teachers, mm. having more black male teachers, having more black um, female teachers, um, having that having that diversity. Because if I look at myself, I remember when my um, one of my teachers told me that, oh, I, I can't go to um, the Russell Group Uni that I applied for, that I should go to a, le a less uni, I'm not gonna get into that. And I left that place feeling like, oh, okay, I, I can't do it. And it was, uh, it was my mum who actually told me, yes, you can, you wanna go there? then work hard, you're gonna do it. And then I said, okay, cool, I'm gonna do it. And where did I go? I went to the exact uni that that teacher told me I would not get into. Mm. So it's important that you have those kind of people that support you as an individual. Of course, we don't wanna make teachers feel like, oh, you know, they're not doing enough, but it, it's so important that we don't look at children as what we subconsciously think about them and actually empower every single individual, white, black, mixed race, whatever your culture does not matter. I once um, ran a programme in which one of the parents got up and said, um, I wouldn't want anybody teaching my daughter, a black girl, mm -hmm. who can't imagine that she could be Prime Minister of the United Kingdom. Um, uh, that was a very positive, very confident parent. But uh, careers guidance and other advice mechanisms within the educational system mm -hmm. also streams children mm -hmm. and makes them either fit or unfit to maximise their potential when they get into society. What's your experience of the careers guidance system that's available to our, our children today? Hmm, to be honest, personally, I've not used a lot of careers guidance because I think um, growing up, my parents did a fine job of letting me know who I could be and what I could become. They always pushed us to aim for the stars, and if we didn't catch it, we'll land. We aim for the for the moon, and if you didn't, you get you get fall amongst the stars. So for me, I can't personally. I've not had a rich experience of that. But from anecdotal ex um, conversations, from speaking to people, I've learned, I've heard that I've been told that a lot of times, as a black student, the bar that's set for you is very low your expectation is very low. And that's because um, career guidance um, teachers, often where they see black people, their understanding or representation of black people is not in those top places. And so that's where they project on these children that you're gonna end up anyway. Can I, can I say Gina Yashari's famous joke is that for a Nigerian parent, there are four career oh options. Yes. Oh yeah. Doctor, lawyer, oh yeah. engineer, mm. and? You're a failure. Failure to the family, <laughs> yeah. okay. So the question, my question arising from that yeah. is that everybody knows that the STEM subjects are the way forward now for young people. Mm. Do African and Caribbean parents do enough to steer their children in those directions? Because you have told me that the schools are not fulfilling that purpose. Mm -hmm. Do they? Um, see, I would actually counter argue that view because I actually feel like a lot of African um, culture place education very highly and unfortunately I believe that they're limited because they think that it's only maths, English and science that, that my child needs in order to exceed. However, the times are changing, creativity is, is, is expanding, people are making a millions of just having a YouTube. So it's important to understand that even within African culture, within black culture, that we actually understand that our child does not need to be a doctor, lawyer, accountant or a failure in order to succeed. We need to get with the times, we need to understand what ways my child's skills can be used in order to succeed because if you don't do that mm -hmm. the problem is your child will then feel like because they're not good at mass English and science they are a failure and that is not true. What do you think that parents can do to chivy schools along in the direction that their children require? Do you think the parents are vocal enough or do you think that the parents very much as they do in Africa and the Caribbean 
have a lot of faith and trust in the educational system mm -hmm. and of course in those places they are generally not let down but do you think that faith and trust is well placed within the educational system we encounter here in the United Kingdom? See, everything has changed, the world has changed, and the liberation of black people is now upon us. It is on our own hands, and we by ourselves have to call for that change. So I don't think parents are as vocal as they can be. They need to, I think parents can do a little bit more to, to, hold, to hold institutions' feet to the fire, to hold the educational system's feet to the fire, to demand for these things. You rightfully said that parents pay taxes, and so they expect, they should, well, should be able to expect certain things of educational institutions and so if you're not getting it's like if you're paying tax for anything else if the roads are not good you're going to complain about yeah. it so if you feel like your children are not getting the best education we need to be talking about these things as well I'd like you both to respond to to some stats here apparently black male graduates earn 17% less than white male graduates per hour even after controlling for factors such as age location and occupation the figure for black graduate women is 9% less than for white women. Mm. Tell me why. I think sometimes it might be down to a confidence issue. I recently had a, uh, had a conversation with somebody in a job I worked in and um, I, the person found out that we were not earning the same and I was earning more. And the person was shocked and asked me why. I said, because I negotiated. I asked for more and mm. so I got more. And this person's a white male and so should ride that privilege mm. to be able to get more but was shocked that I was getting more and I said it's because I asked for it. Mm. So she's got guts. Yeah. Um, what are the other causes for, yeah. for this kind of differential that we see? I mean we're, we're not gonna beat around the bush we know that there's institutionalized racism and what we do know you mean by that? So within the fact that you know without being overtly racist mm -hmm. the system can play about covert racism so mm -hmm. it can limit you because of your color of your skin or mm -hmm. whatever mm -hmm. but I do think that it's the fact that a lot of people aren't actually aware of what is available to them mm -hmm. I do think a lot of um, the black community may not be aware of you know what essentially what is available to them what they actually have access to um, similar to what you said even before there are actually a lot of black families that I personally know that are very well educated that that are getting those children into scholarships I have you know communities within from Milton Keynes CBMK that are doing exploits getting young black children into um, Oxbridge and all of that but it's the access you know are they aware um, uh, they might not be aware of it so based on the discussion we've had in the first couple of parts as far as you're concerned what's your answer to the question are we miseducating our children see we Ooh. <laughs> well our children are not getting the best that they could get okay. is the thing okay and from your point of view what do you think uh, Daniel are our children being miseducated I don't believe we can say they're being miseducated because that will mean that ed the edu current education is a waste of time. However, they are missing vital, um, vital things that are imperative in order to, for them to fully flourish, yeah. that's what I'll say. Yes. Well, that's the end of part two. But join us after the break when I'll be joined by Joyce Abolade and Esther Akinola. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank, Thank you. you. It's good to be here. What if I were to tell you about Kolade's other woman? Have you lost faith in me? What have you done to inspire faith? My children will get everything they deserve and more! Even if it takes my last breath. The competent and exceedingly astute next CEO of BVP is... What if I were to tell you about Kolade's other woman? Have you lost faith in me? What have you done to inspire faith? My children will get everything they deserve and more! Even if it takes my last breath. The competent and exceedingly astute 
next CEO of BBP is. And welcome back. You're watching Your Voice with me, Ted Kofi, and I'm joined now by my guest for the second half of the show. There's well-being educator and writer Joyce Abolade and social media consultant Esther Akinola. Now, we start first with the insights of a 15-year-plus professional in the teaching world. Dalian Adofu is a teacher of 15 years' experience, published academic researcher, and Community Learning Program Director. I spoke to Dalian earlier today, and this is what he had to say. Dalian Adolfo, it's wonderful to have you join us in this great conversation. Um, you have over 15 years experience of actually teaching within the educational system. Do you think, in your opinion, that the system does enough to teach black students about their own cultural identity. Um, hello, Ted. Um, thanks for having me again um, on your show. You know, um, pleasure to be here. Um, it's a very important question you've raised, and to be honest, the simple answer is is no. It's no. Um, it's it's not enough being done, and there are a few reasons for this. Okay, be it the first being that. The curriculum is more focused at what job opportunities there are. It doesn't do enough per se to teach the well-being of um, the children themselves or reflecting the diversity of the children within that educational space. Um, so for instance, I'll just give a, an example here. When, when you're studying history and you, you, you are taught about the Romans, there, there's never any explicit references made to the fact that some of the Roman emperors were black. And when I say black, I mean not in the political term, but black as in of African descent. You know, some of um, the popes themselves, even um, a very famous general here in the UK who built what we call Hadrian's Wall. Yes, he was an African from the place we now call Libya. And this is not um, an Arab. We're talking a black African. So, you know, um, what, what we, we, might, we might find south of the Sahara, you know, um, that type of African. All these um, important aspects of history get whitewashed. So as a child of African or even non-white descent, when you engage with this curriculum, what you get is a revised version of history that everybody in there was European, uh, AKA white. And as a result, you in this history or in this historical context, you only find yourself as someone who's always dependent on the beneficence and the superiority or intelligence of the Europeans who came before. Yes, so that's just one example where we could have made this history very explicit, but you won't find it there. It's still taught in a very, you know, Romans were all white. They went around, they, they conquered the whole world, and that's where the story ends. You know, we, we dominated everyone. Okay. Tell me, why are there so many exclusions of black children from schools? Um, the reasons for the exclusions is the same reasons where, where or why we find that black adults also, in terms of their treatment in the workplace. It starts off with institutionalized racism. That's the first and most important or the most damaging factor. Then we also have the teacher bias or prejudice towards black children in the way that they view black children. Because there is always this preconceived idea that this child is only headed for prison or for criminality. So not as much effort will be put into um, challenging or motivating these children to do more than they're capable of. Rather, they'll let them slide or glide through. And then the next option is exclude them and put them in a pupil referral unit, which, which as the data shows, it's part of a pipeline from education to prison. So we have to deal with teacher bias. I must ask this, what do you, when you talk about the institutionalized racism within the education service, what do you mean by that? 
Well, um, one example of that is the, um, let's look at progression for black educators. Had, if you go to any school setting, very, very, very few, I, I, I didn't get to, to bring the data, but it's, it's actually ridiculous, the amount of black head teachers are primary and secondary. Because remember, these are the formative years. So for a black child in such an educational context, the most black people they see are the people who are cleaning, or the janitors, yes? So even in that educational space, their whole worldview is, the reason I'm going to school is to become like, I don't know, the other black person that I see who is in a space of servitude. So a very key part of the educational transaction is motivation or aspiration to succeed. So institutionalized racism prevents black educators who are qualified from taking middle and upper management positions. So that has the knock-on effect of showing that black people can't get ahead. Is that glass ceiling? I'm, I must ask the next question now. How effective in your experience and opinion is career guidance for black kids within our system here in the UK? Oh, it's, it's absolutely um, essential uh, because most children Black oh, children. I know when, it's essential. Sorry. I know it's essential. What I mean is how effective is it? Well, it's, it, can't, it can only be as effective as the type of institutionalized racism they will face when they go for the jobs. So the career guidance generally d doesn't have, should we say, any um, particular pathways. For, it's open for all the children. However, you will even find that in some of these career guidances, they will direct the black child towards what they perceive black people to be good at. So go for sports, go for um, a media related role or singing, acting, the creative spaces. We hardly find many being directed towards um, careers in STEM, you know, the, the sciences and the maths and the engineering. Hardly ever do they push black children. And again, it's also because in a certain way, this behavior reflects the fact that most of these career advisors know that these black children will be actively resisted when they try and enter these job pathways. Very unlike what they would do for, let's say, Asian or Chinese children. So yeah, there's a, a very big bias there too that needs addressing. That's fascinating. Tell me, um, do you think I've, I've, I've already imputed a response to this, but I need to hear it from yourself. Do you think that black children in our educational system see yes. enough role models as they grow through the system, positive role models? Um, absolutely not. Absolutely not. This is why we find that most black children seem to aspire for these roles of being a musician or uh, an actor or something that we find in the creative spaces. Because most of the role models they see, they see on music videos, the rappers, the singers, you know? Um, we, we, we don't have enough, let's say, physicists or scientists. And again, it's not that we don't have enough, but they're not popularized enough. That is the key thing, because the amount of black inventors, scientists is overwhelming, but they are, actively removed from the curriculum you know and um, just let's let's use the example of the ladies who helped the first nasa probe that went into space you don't find them in the educational curriculum they will tell you it was just nasa and by default is white people who implemented that but where were these women it took this century for a film to be made about their contribution towards that that program so no they don't they don't see a lot of um, positive representation not at all so so finally Dalian. Um, in your opinion, yes. are we miseducating our children? Um, yes, we, we miseducate our children if we leave them to only learn from the formal curriculum. Every black family or parent or parents have to make active efforts to engage with the black supplementary schools that are littered all over the country. Because what they do, their children will not find in the formal system, they will find that in these informal learning spaces, which are equally as valuable as the formal spaces, may I add, because they add that motivation and aspirational um, support that your child will need to engage with formal education. 
it's absolutely essential. Um, yeah, yeah, otherwise, no your child is mis miseducated. Fantastic. Dalian Adolfo, thank you so much for spending your time with us. These are wonderful insights which we're going to take into the studio with us. Have a great day. Thank you day. very much. Thank, to, you. thank you too for having me, Ted. It's been a pleasure, as always. Wow. Um, I did that interview this morning and um, I could have continued talking with him for about an hour. Um, your comment, first of all, um, how did you find him? I think he definitely made some valid points in terms of traditional and not so traditional subjects. I think he kind of, he almost implied as if more creative subjects and subjects that leaned away from um, our traditional academia is of l less value. As if to say that just simply because young black people aren't seeing um, black physicists, uh, black doctors, black engineers on TV and in their textbooks, they're being pushed to the more um, maybe softer subjects which in my opinion I don't think is less valuable at all I completely understand what he's saying based on where I'm seated and what I've observed a lot of traditional black families a lot of black families in general do push their children towards engineering medicine biology the quote unquote harder subjects and um, some families are okay with their children moving towards more creative subjects which I don't feel is of any less value but if are, point are, is, the create, are the creative uh, the new so-called so-called softer subjects um, um, a valid alternative for young black kids and will it improve their job prospects going forward um, in a way, I get what his point is, meaning there's not enough emphasis on the people who are doing the harder subjects. There's not enough emphasis to see how well they're doing or to highlight the, the, the greatness is what their work is or, you know, how appreciated or the potential of their work rather than, you know, just limiting them to things that people enjoy. When, this is not diminishing the point of it's a good role. Like, you know, when you're into music or basketball, or whatever, it's good and you're making money and that's brilliant. But I believe, I understand what you're saying whereby black kids are often put there because they try to limit our children. That's my point of view. Okay. They're being limited in the, in, the, in the career pathway, basically. I'm going to ask you a googly question. Mm. What is the ethnicity of the person who is coding the driverless cars for Uber right now? Is he white or black? I have no idea. Most likely, it most likely black because I would like to believe it's black. <laughs> well, black he, he's black. <laughs> would you like to guess his age? Probably like in his late twenties. Okay. Same guess. Yes. Okay. Yeah. The boy is nineteen. Oh, wow. He's really? from Ghana. Oh. He yeah. has been through MIT. Wow. He stopped in his second year, and the MIT is a license to print money mm. if you qualify from MIT. However, he is absolutely awash with success. Mm. Now, because people don't know that people like this exist, they will go for the people who they know exist. Mm. Who is the best qualified black minister in the United Kingdom? Hazard know. a guess? We don't know either. He's a minister. Sure. This is actually a minister of state. I don't know. Kwesi Kwarteng. Oh, I know that guy, yeah. Okay, yeah. do you know what his academic background is? No idea. Okay, he went to Eton. He got his first degree in Cambridge. He got his second degree in Cambridge. And he's doing his PhD now at Oxford. Mm. Now, who knows that? Um, I, I mentioned these characters for you to give me a comment on how important publicity is for the different career paths. How important do you think it is? I think it's quite important because it encourages the younger generation or the people coming be after us to know that there's a path where there's a means for them to get there or it's possible. You know, when you see someone of your same race, someone black like yourself, mm -hmm. you think, okay, um, it's capable, I can do it. But when, and also the, the level of appreciation people like that don't get. Some people think, mm, I don't want it because you're not getting enough like, um, recognition, recognition for your role. Whereby, you know, someone like Jay-Z or the big people in the big industry mm -hmm. that are black, they get lots of bravado, a lot of greatness, or people appreciate them oh, a bit absolutely. more. So, yeah, the kid wants that. You do, like, we want that joy, we want that appreciation. And someone like the two people you've mentioned, whom I don't know about, I have to be very honest, um, don't get enough recognition, and that is needed. We need our children to know they're capable and more than capable of achieving that. I think that's very important because within the education, they don't show us these people. We don't know who these people are. True. Well, 
Um, we're going to go um, uh, to a break now. So that's the end of part three. Join us after the break when we'll be coming to a conclusion on our conversation today on whether we're indeed miseducating our children. Right here on Your Voice. Welcome back. You're watching Your Voice with me, Ted Kofi, and my guests, Joyce Abulade and Esther Akinola. Ladies, I, I want to come back to this thing of the traditional sciences versus the modern, uh, the modern disciplines. Um, here's a stat. BA, BAME people are 50% more likely to go to university than their white peers. Yet, this is not reflected in certain careers. According to the Royal Academy of Engineering, 26% of UK engineering students are actually from BAME backgrounds. Yet, only 6% of professional engineers are BAME. Now, would you have thought that 26% of UK engineering students were BAME? Uh, th that fact does not surprise me at all. At all. Not even a little bit. No. Yeah. So this is something that this doesn't shock you? Uh, no, it really no. doesn't. I feel okay. like the more traditional African people all tend to push their children in that direction yeah. anyway. Very good. Yeah. So why there are, are only 6% of the professional engineers from people working as professional engineers, why only 6% are from those backgrounds? Who are the people interviewing the pe black exactly. people who is sitting there exactly it's usually the white man who's been there for years who doesn't want to get off that role exactly. that's often seated there there is no workforce diversity in most companies and we need more of that exactly. we need to implement changes we need more black people seated at those interviews to create changes for our people that is the change we demand in most companies it's, it's just the bare minimum that needs to be done yeah i feel like that's the obvious thing there's not enough black people in directorial seats yes. so how are we supposed to face our familiars and give ourselves the opportunity to be hired for these jobs when um the people hiring us don't see themselves in us in the first place i feel like that one is it's pretty obvious why we're not in those positions in the first place i don't necessarily think it's just even the people on the top because oftentimes you have people at the top who are not doing the interviews yeah. you've got the 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 people below them, and there's a system, there's an hierarchy thing. The middle there. management. Yeah, yeah, the big middle management. And they get directors from the top, mm -hmm. and they don't want to ruffle the boat. A lot mm -hmm. of people, yeah. um, mm, they walk on eggshells, basically. <laughs> they don't want to say <gasps> the real stuff they want oh. to say. They don't want to be honest, OK? Who is everybody? P please be clear about this. OK. I mean, give me anecdotes from I'm your talking life from experience. White people. OK, from my life experience where I work, you've got white management mm -hmm. who are scared of being honest with you mm -hmm. who are scared of being transparent mm -hmm. and saying our taste like okay we don't want someone too loud mm. someone too real someone too honest about their experiences yeah. what, what, what is too loud too real it too honest mean? basically anything that associates with black culture yeah. black colloquialism black mannerisms yes. whenever it's like when you do job interviews i remember this one time i was interviewed by a lady that said we think you'll fit in here we think you'll be comfortable here i think you, we would get along with you. When I started the role, I noticed that everyone in the office was a white person. And by them saying that I would get along with them, it meant that I spoke like them. I made them feel comfortable. comfortable. They could see like a, maybe a European familiar familiarity within me. Whereas if I was maybe a black girl from maybe a more poorer background or like, you know, the South or something, they may have not said those yeah. exact words. I don't know if that came across as a compliment to her, but it wasn't to me. Okay, t t no, no, tell me though. Um, so are we barking up the wrong tree? Is this about more about doing the social arithmetic than having the right qualifications? Not necessarily. I think we have to be real true to ourselves. There's no point you going somewhere not being true to yourself because then that takes away the point of you being black in the first instance. We need to hone our blackness now. There's no more, no, no, one, no more excuses for anyone, okay? So when you go to an interview, be yourself. B, use your social arithmetic and use, include everything together because education is not limited to just what you learn or what exams you're doing. It's broad. It's about emotional intelligence. It's about your understanding of the, same, the other man. Um, one thing she mentioned about um, 
you would fit in, like, you know, that you will get on with you or something like that. I had an interview like three weeks ago and the word I heard was, you're too passionate. Too passionate. You're too passionate. And then, and if I tell you I felt like I flawed that interview, I was very certain I was going to get that role. Mm -hmm. And the word I got was, oh, you're too passionate during the interview. Mm -hmm. And then, oh, we felt like you didn't answer some questions. Can you explain? They can't, they stuttered. And I realised, you know what, they're not ready for this. They don't want it because our black is too beautiful. They can't undo our blackness. I'm no more being, no more giving excuses to nobody. Okay, so <laughs> what she's talking about is a cultural identity and cultural yes. form of expression, Basically. which she believes the United Kingdom is not yet ready for. Yeah. What's your view on that? Um, in terms of your original question, whether it's uh, based on like social norms or your education, yeah. I think it's definitely a balance between the both of them. Yeah. There are some people, white people specifically, that don't have the full qualifications needed for a job, yet somehow they manage to land that very big job yeah. rather than a black person who may have had all the qualifications, all the experience, internship experience, mm. and have gotten the job. If the person interviewing you, who's most likely white, does not see themselves or familiar within you, it's very unlikely that they're going mm. to hire yeah. you. That's they true. want to feel that like they can see themselves in you. And I don't remember the last time I ever thought an old white man could see themselves in a young <laughs> black lady. You were both in the educational system yeah. rather more recently than somebody like <laughs> me. Was there any aspect of your education which taught you how to cope with the issues you are discussing? I have not read one single government report that talks about people being too real, too passionate and too honest. I have not read any official documentation which deals with these issues. How did your education teach you to cope with this is a re you're not making this up. This is a reality you're describing. Mm. How did your education enable you prepare you for for this reality? My educational system did not prepare me for this reality mm. in the slightest. If anything um, just I feel like just being around my peers uh, my non-black peers, my um, people of colour who are still not black peers, I felt like just being around them kind of prepared me for my life beyond education and kind of just experiencing institutional life, basically it prepared me for. So, so actually mentorship is very important both within the educational institution and outside in your world of work. Where is this mentorship to be found? Nowhere. But my view is we as a community need to stand together and start providing that for people we know. We do have some though. Mm, we have a not, lot actually. They Can, they hold on, not, carry on. They're not sponsored. There's no enough funded. There's no resources. How do you maintain these things? How do you carry on with these things? Uh, where, where, where do they, the people doing these things get support from? Okay, can, you, can mm. you say that, that these organisations exist? I think can you give me examples of the ones that you're referring to now? So, uh, recently I was part of a, um, a mentorship programme called BME PR Pros, which is run by an amazing woman called Elizabeth Bananuka. This is basically a, um, a programme specifically for people of colour who are trying to get into like the work in industry and they each person gets a mentor that is also a person of color is that into the world of PR that is into the world of, yes it's into the world but of PR and marketing and all, all sorts of but stuff this is not publicized this oh, is the I think they're have. trying and there's a lot of um, com mentorship programs that are by white people that are not as publicized but I think it's a matter of just knowing where to go and doing the correct research but how okay. do we get our people knowing this information I do apologize Shit. how do we do that it's Google it's being in the right places at the right time putting yourself in black network I know Nothing ever stopped me from going to black networking um, uh, events. Nothing stopped me from, you know, talking to people, black people in directoral positions. Well, entire, like, like people come from different backgrounds, okay? So they, we've got the affluent people who get That's the information. True. And we've got people That's who true. don't have that information. Mm -hmm. access to but internet. they're passionate about it, they want it, yeah. but they don't have the access, access to that information. So, so, I mean, adding up all the information that we're discussing, uh, re referring back to what Dalian had to say yeah. uh, on his wonderful VT day, uh, do you think that we are miseducating our children in the current system. What's your view? To some extent, to some extent. I can't fully say we are completely because, you know, our parents do do some great job for yeah. us, you know, yeah, and to some extent we... Uh, we but, uh, but what your parents are doing and what the educational system is doing are two, two completely di of different course, things. Of course, but they're all interlinked, okay? Right. So the education system, for me, failed me. I'm going to be very transparent. The right. educational system is... 
This will be unorthodox, but it's a mess. It's an absolute mess for the black kids. It's, mm -hmm. it's a mess. Because where is the, the, the policies that are supposed to BAME? What's the support in there for the BAME kid mm -hmm. or for the black kid in the mm -hmm. school? Um, rather than just labeling them as a bad child. Where is the anti-bullying policy that depicts that once you're racist, you get kicked off rather okay. than the kid mm. be getting kicked off. Esther, what's your what is that? Where is that? Uh, I also Esther, where's agree. your where's your answer to, to, to this question? Uh, black, are we miseducating our children? Yeah. I don't think we're miseducating our children. No. I think there's just a lot of missed opportunities to educate our children further than the traditional academia. There's things in history we don't know about, there's stuff about geography we don't know about, and the fa and there's also like this terrible thing where we try to teach all children in the same way, expecting the same results. But that's miseducation, mm. no? Could you hold on? To yeah. an extent. I think it's to an extent because there are some children that are flourishing with this kind of education, but I think when it comes to black children or even maybe any a kind of child, we need to tailor our education to, to sort of suit that child better. Okay. Yeah. Thank you very much. Look, um, I'm going to leave you with this comment, uh, which just came in from James from Milton Keynes. And he says, it starts from home, your community and your family, to let your black child be aware that they are also part of this society and can achieve whatever they want before they go out there to face the world. You don't really have to work twice as hard, but know your rights and don't let anyone sell you a decoy. Mm. And on that note, that's all, sadly, we have time for on this edition of Your Voice. Thank you to my guests in this part, Joyce Abolade and Esther Akinola, and of course, to my earlier guests, Danielle Roxon and C.Y. Ochoga. And thank you for watching. I'm Ted Kofi. Please join us again next time here on Your Voice. It seems extraordinary that there's nothing that the coronavirus doesn't touch. We all see Black Lives Matter demonstrations. Oppression is brought out. So unfortunately, I just feel like we're, we're going down this road. We've been down this road before.